How could a child born for the sole purpose of revenge still be able to find beauty in the world? This second season was a wild ride, and it made me realize that there's a duality at the core of Made in Abyss that has been present since we were on the surface, and the deeper we traverse the layers of the abyss, the much more it's made apparent. Fittingly, I might add. So if you watched Dawn of the Deep Soul and still made the decision to go beyond the fifth layer, then there's no going back for us. We're getting exactly what we asked for. And with that, I will also be unreserved with spoilers. Unlike what came before, this season makes it a point to remind you at every turn that this is a godforsaken messed up world. Whether it's the tonal whiplash with specific characters like the shopkeeper and his one-liner at fixing Rico's whistle, which took what could have been a wholesome moment, a heartfelt nice moment, and just made it feel dirty. Or in the visual design of cute creatures like Ma, who for some reason are incredibly caked up. <laughs> Or just the whole setting of the season that takes place in this sort of violently twisted capitalist society that is in the sixth layer where the logic behind it makes sense, but their nonchalant attitude toward body horror just seems incredibly surreal. Made in Abyss repeatedly juxtaposes things that are cute and comforting with things that are disturbing, grotesque, gruesome, and downright horrifying. It instills beauty and wonder with the unflattering truth and an often vicious and unforgiving reality creating this sort of dissonance. Think Yuru Camp sitting in the same room with Berserk. Normally, a sanitized version of the world is often shown through kids' shows to shield the younger ones from tougher realities. And these two depictions are kept separate, such as with like Disney movies, Ghibli, etc. Made in Abyss knows this association that we have in our mind and uses it to challenge us in a powerful and visceral way by having a show that's both. Duality is even present in its protagonist, Rico, who is both dead and undead, human and inhuman. From Orth, on the surface, it was very subtle, but it was there, a culture built around the profits made from the Abyss. Orphans being used as the perfect candidates to be trained from a young age to want to be cave raiders since no one will really mourn them when they're gone. The cute vibes mixed in with the logical realizations both alarm and disarm you. And in a way, they are sacrificing them to the abyss for profit. The culture above parallels the culture below, a culture that has monetized this longing. Children who don't have proper homes or families, similar to the ganja. The society down below is just a more twisted version of this, where they've created a refuge that exists on trading and increasing their own value, all while being built off of the person that I'd argue they valued the least in their group. The further you go down into the abyss, it seems, the more morally bankrupt you can expect the humans you find down there to be, because they've sacrificed everything else to get down there. They've obviously prioritized what they desire most, and we've gotten this duality with the adults we've met so far, such as Ozen, who's merciless and brutal with children, but also caring in her own twisted way, Liza, who loves Rico enough to sacrifice everything to bring her back up from the abyss, but then chooses to go back down herself, leaving her child behind for like 10 years. And then more egregious examples, such as with Bondrude, who is both caring and loving, but is still willing to sacrifice everything and everyone for the advancement of science. And that all comes down to the nature of the abyss itself. Since season one, there have been subtle hints to the religious origins of abyss exploration, such as the countless skeletons that we've found of praying people, the term abyssal faith existing, which is the belief that all souls return to the abyss, and the fifth layer originally being a ritual site. This all seems at odds with the reputation of the abyss as this netherworld. It gives it a sense of sacredness and power over the fate of humanity when it's just a man-eating hole in the ground. It's not sentient, at least we think. But for early humans traversing for the first time, it's understandable that they'd be charmed and fooled by its vast wonder. Its grandeur leads its challengers to believe that it contains something equally grand within. This is what makes the abyss a passive predator. It uses its force field to carry light and nutrients down, but it also keeps you from seeing its depths from the surface. The mysteriousness allows it to make itself alluring and invoke curiosity. What makes it even more enticing is that the outer layers are wondrous and manageable enough to make it tempting to go further down. However, the further you go down, the more hostile and unforgiving the environment and creatures become there that make it much harder to survive. And this brings us to the sixth layer, where the magical facade is dropped because the abyss no longer has to do any more work to 
you know, lure you down there. You're, you're trapped. You already came down of your own volition. And that is why the unsuspecting ganja squad gets what they get when they arrive there. It's a scorching hot and barren wasteland with dangerous threats and very little to no resources that make human life even sustainable. But what it does offer these weary travelers is an embodiment of its signature brand of curses and blessings. Ah, yes, the Cradle of Desire, a monkey's paw type relic that grants its users not what they truly wish for, but more of what they literally ask for, which ends up being more like a curse. It also tends to come at a high price. In this case, bodies are its currency. With relics such as the Cradle of Desire, the Abyss allows humans to do the harm to themselves. The Cradle takes their value in exchange for a distorted version of what they wanted. And this is how Iruburu Village is formed, which might be thought to have been the Ganja members' salvation at the time. However, they've sacrificed their autonomy to be stuck in a section of the sixth layer of the abyss where they constantly get their short-term desires fulfilled in order to placate their actual longings to leave. And all of this was created by essentially sacrificing one of their members and turning them into a pseudo-god versus something miraculous that they initially expected to find in the abyss itself. Because that's what the abyss is. It's a void that repurposes what you put into it. It doesn't create life, it recycles and reconfigures. The toll to get into the sixth layer is basically sacrificing another human. Blessings in the abyss are created from the strong bonds of other humans. The abyss preys on pure souls. That is its delight. It gives the illusion of being a giver, but its blessings are made out of all of its victims that died along the journey. And what the squad essentially created with Iruburu Village is a microcosm of the larger abyss, where they're luring in other creatures and recycling value in order to create things that couldn't exist elsewhere. It's a damn wishing well. You can get whatever you want in there, if you have something of equal value to sacrifice. Their bodies have been sacrificed as the toll for entering, and their souls remain locked in. With this, they have adopted the Abyss's own nature, of morphing their own humanity into something that isn't quite human. They've become, as stated in Season 1, beings who have become one with their personal convictions and continue to watch on with inhuman eyes. Okay, I totally paraphrase that, but... That's the gist of it. That's what it said. And this leads me to the guy responsible for bringing them all down to the sixth layer in the first place. And that's Wazukian, the one they call the Prophet. Wazukian is one of the most ambiguous characters this season. There's just something about him that makes it hard to get a full grasp on him. Because unlike the others who bear in human eyes, his eyes are shielded because you can never know his agenda or what he's truly thinking. Not even us viewers are privy to his visions of the future. He has this strange dichotomy to him where he always comes off as harmless and easygoing, but at the same time, through his actions, we've come to know he's very determined and also dangerous. This is how he serves as another parallel to Rico in her fervent desire to reach the bottom of the abyss and her extreme devotion to people she cares about where she seriously considers sacrificing her body parts just to get them back. Similar to Von Drood, Wazukian might have started with good intentions, but in his desire to be special, to continue to play the leading role, he let his visions consume him and eventually became an abuser in Vueco's life, kind of like Jeroimo. Even if he takes a different form, he still uses her to his own ends. We can see this in the way he exploits her bond with Irumui to keep her going to the point of even imprisoning her. Even if it's not clear what exact wishes were made, it's very possible he manipulated Irumui to becoming something she never really wished for while Veko was incapacitated. Because he's the type to do everything that he can, as stated by him. And he's the most valued member in the group because of his gift as well as his strong belief in himself, which gives him considerable power in playing things to his favor, especially when it comes to convincing children or people that don't have high value in themselves. In this case, it would be Vueko, Irumui, and pretty much all of the young members of the Ganja Squad who are also outcasts. He most likely genuinely wanted believers to get their prayers answered and continue to have hope, but he definitely wanted to be the one to make it happen. This becomes very apparent in the lengths Wazukian goes to for his followers and how little he cares for those who fall outside of that circle. The best example of this is how he continuously tries to get Rico injured multiple times throughout the season in order to gather everything he needs in order to meet his goals. As Nanachi deduced, his plan was in fact to harm Rico in order to force Reg to seek out the Cradle of Desire. He knew Rico's value to Reg, however this wasn't just towards the end, this was likely his intention all throughout their time there. If you pay attention, her very first encounter with him is right after she almost gets assaulted by the other Hollows moments before, and the first thing he asks her is if she's enjoying her time there, 
and then proceeds to comment that he knows the hollows can be a pain at times, and he looks right at Ma, who is the one that inadvertently saved her, which ruins his plans. Now, this can easily be dismissed on the first watch because Ma had previously hurt Menya, so it would make sense that that's what he was referring to. And this would probably be true if he didn't go on to lie to Reg that he needs to get a piece of Faputa in order to trade to Bella for Nanachi's freedom, knowing full well that Bella would never accept that. And then after Rico deduces that he wants her to use the Cradle of Desire to set the villagers free, he asks Rico and Reg what they will choose to do, and then suddenly, Jeroimo pops out. And then on top of that, as revealed in the last episode, he reinforced the village, allowing monsters from the outside to come into the village. That was his last ditch effort. And once Fabita gets her mother's memories, he only takes Weko down below with him as insurance since she'd be valuable to Fabita and he could use her as a bargaining chip. Unlike Bondrude, who was led by his curiosity to make discoveries that could advance civilization, Wazukyan was led by his desire to become something, to have the journey itself transform him into something that could transcend humanity, like a god or a legend. And this is all because Wazukyan takes value in the extraordinary quest to get the gold that he's seeking, but the quest is pointless if he doesn't have an audience to witness it with him. And okay, it might seem unfair to put all of this on Wazukyan when the villagers were also complicit in this, but while it's easy to think that everything Wazukyan did was for them, there are signs that point to Wazukyan not being as self-sacrificing as he seems. Because if you think about it, he never sacrificed anything he valued. He sacrificed what the other two sages valued to meet his own ends. Belof lost his convictions and Vweko lost Irumui. He could have spun the Irumui situation any which way, and he made it seem to his followers that it was okay to live inside Irumui as if offering their bodies would offer forgiveness, like some sort of divine provenance. So that's why when he speaks to Vweko of hope for adventurers to have a sanctuary in the future, I wouldn't put it past him that he was hoping for an opportunity for potential sacrifices that could come free them from their fate. Perhaps some heaven-sent children. When pushed to the extreme, everything became to ensure that he could continue on his journey. Unfortunately for Wazukyan, he ends up an empty husk, with no value gained and nothing of value passed on, unlike Weko and Belof, who still had their cherished memories. He had no legend to speak of because his journey ended long ago, and there was very little reward for all of his effort. That's why I think he's full of a lot of regret. He had a plan. He had banked on the villagers to prioritize their survival like he did, but instead, they chose compassion by deciding to sacrifice themselves to Faputa, which is something he discarded long ago. And it's his last few words that are the most telling of this, and also in defining the type of journey Rico and her friends are truly on. Now, it might be odd for me to say that, considering the main three felt very sidelined this season, especially Nanachi, but with the pronounced emphasis on the interference units this season, it made me feel like, in an indirect way, the main three were being likened to them. Gathering all of this knowledge, being observers, and facilitating this conflict finally being able to come to a conclusion. And being observers in itself has been shown to have value. Thanks to Belloff's memories, Nanachi was able to properly move on from her guilt and accept that Midi will continue to be a part of her for the rest of her life. Unlike Vueco, Reg was finally able to make a decision to protect what he values, and Fabita is able to inherit all of her mother's value and be free to pursue whatever she wants. So what does that leave for Rico? Rico came into her own by having to rely solely on herself this season, but she kind of had the least emotional development. She still has her innocence intact, and even though Wazukan's words seem to imply that she'll find what she's looking for at the bottom of the abyss, it'll cause her to despair when it turns out to be not exactly what she wanted. It might break her. But I think he was talking more about himself in that moment, because it's also implied that Wazukan's visions might have come to an end once he entered Irumui, and realize he still wasn't fulfilled. Riko is also fundamentally different from Wazukyan because she's not actually looking for any gold. She values traversing the darkness and seeing what she discovers to uncover the truth at the bottom of the abyss, to unravel its nature, be it heaven or hell. She just needs to know. However, when put into an inescapable situation where she's faced with an extreme decision, will she still be able to keep her humanity? In his final words, Wazukyan states that one can only transcend their humanity through accumulation. Moments before that, he mentions how the village and Rico's group were able to accomplish what they did by their accumulation of good deeds. So in contrast, when speaking about accumulation while reflecting on his journey down into the netherworld and what he's experienced since then, one way to read what he's saying is that hell can be created by the accumulation of misdeeds. Wazukyan and the villagers weren't monsters. They became monsters slowly by continually turning the other eye to what horrible things they were doing until they finally became numb to it. 
They let one thing pass and then the other until they were no longer human. They wanted more and more, and it was this subtle descent into something else. The kids are on the very tip of it, receiving their knowledge and blessings, but on the edge of becoming something else depending on what path they pick. The road to hell might break them, and they might become the same. It's not just what the abyss does to the body, but to the soul. The compromising of morality to do what needs to be done paired with the urge to keep going. Both good and bad exist. They were forced to keep feeding the bad, and their desire for more became unhinged. Wazukyan knew he was far gone, but he could no longer stop. He had come too far to turn back. But no matter his efforts, it was Faputa who inherited it all. She is the embodiment of a blessing born from a curse. She is innocence and rage hope and despair. She is the crystallization of all of the villagers' wishes to roam freely in the abyss, and now she can do as she pleases, held down by nothing. And the main three, especially Rico, get to witness all of the facets of her nature, and they embrace it. As Gaborun had observed, how can a child born for the sole purpose of revenge still be able to find beauty in the world? What this season manages to show is that this sense of duality has been interwoven all throughout the show, and the abyss itself serves to remind us at every turn that the world has the capacity to show us joy and also brutality. Wishes can also be curses, and by extension, any journey through the true darkness of the unknown can contain both terror and beauty. And whatever we encounter along the way will undoubtedly mark us and shape us. But that part's unavoidable. It's how we choose to move forward every day with all of these things that we've gathered, what we choose to let them represent in our lives that defines our value. Hey there, you have made it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please let me know by giving it a like. And if you have any thoughts on the analysis, any impressions, anything in your mind that you wanna share with me about the video regarding Made in Abyss season two, anything, let me know in the comments below. I'd be really curious to hear those. You know, let's chat. And if you want to stick around uh, for more videos and help the channel grow, please consider subscribing.